Hey there, I'm Heather, and today I'm going to talk to you about 4D seismic data, or what we also call time-lapse seismic data. And um, So time-lapse seismic, I've talked about it a little bit before. It's where we take two or more 3D surveys at different points in time, typically with some production happening in between. Okay, and so the changes in the seismic, as I'm going to show you, are actually really small and hard to see a lot of times. So you want to minimize any differences in the acquisition and processing of these two surveys that are taken at, at those different times. And so not every, um, every reservoir will lend itself to 4D. So there's actually a whole, um, there's a couple papers written on this. Uh, that are really good to, to read through if you're dealing with 4D data or planning a survey. Um, but you need to have uh, certain, certain aspects typically related with the expected differential acoustic impedance contrast and how well you're able to collect the data without a lot of noise um, in order to see those, those very different variations. So if you have very low porosity reservoirs, you may not be able to see it as well. Um, if they're very deep, again, it could be noisier. Um, TP usually have lower porosity. So again, it may not lend itself as well to, to 4D. Um, when we have different types of production, uh, we wanna keep in mind that all of that affects the acoustic impedance. And so this is a nice little summary of Brown um, from the Brown textbook. And so of course, if you uh, produce oiling, oil or gas, um, you uh, with the production of oil, you may see and you have water support, you may see the oil uh, move up in the reservoir. If you're water flooding and maintaining um, pressure support, uh, you may not see a gas cap form, but you could if you're working in a depletion drive area. Um, if you're injecting, so I'm going to show you, I tried to grab a lot of examples of, of data, um, but like steam flooding, uh, you can see those changes in uh, acoustic impedance and 4D data, and same with carbon capture and sequestration. And so I'll show you examples of those too. And so this is kind of a classic example that I have to show <laughs> because I think we talk about it all the time. Um, so this is an example of the Stat Oil Gulfax field. And so they took two surveys, one in 1985 and one in 1999. Um, in 1985, they kind of were full to base with oil. And so you can see that uh, this area that's green and if we zoom in, we can kind of see in the seismic how we've got that nice bright amplitude of blue fluid contact uh, representing the difference between oil and water. And then 14 years later or so, when they took the next acquisition, they had produced a lot of the oil in both of these res reservoirs on either side of the fault. And you can see there's just a small, smaller uh, oil cap remaining. So you could see how the bright spot got, got much dimmer. Um, maybe you could see a little bit of a fluid contact. It's a little bit hard to see. So let's learn about 4D from looking at some examples. So this is a good example from the Brown textbook of the Dury Field steam flood. And so in this case, we've got our vertical seismic and then also looking at it kind of in a map view or chair view, um, where at time zero, all right, so we've got the baseline. So before any uh, steam was injected, and then we've got two months, five, nine, 13, and 19 months going out here. And so you can notice and you can really see the difference first in the map view where we can see that little circle that grow, grows and enlarges through time as they inject more and more steam. And you can see that also in the vertical section. And with that, you also see, so this is a heavy oil field, um, you also see that velocity pull down effect too. Um, here's a cap, uh, a case of an increasing gas cap in Brunei, where in the baseline we have our original gas oil contact up here. Um, and then as time passes in the monitor, you have the present day oil, uh, present day gas oil contact. Um, so that, that gas cap has actually expanded. Okay, so it goes from here down to here. And you can really see it when you look at the difference between the base and the monitor. And so this is a typical method that people use, is looking at the difference between the, three, the two 3D surveys. So when you're doing this and you want to look at the difference and see these subtle changes, you really want to be able to plan and design for repeatability. Um, so this is kind of an image from a survey that I did in the Gulf of Mexico years ago. Um, where we had to think about, okay, in our original survey, 
um, we had, I don't care remember now what it was, like six or eight streamers. And we wanted to make sure that particularly in the midpoint of our cables and our streamers that we covered the same area. Um, and so we ended up adding in extra streamers just to try to cover more area. And so one of the neat things I learned with this uh, survey acquisition is that uh, you, of course, can hire all sorts of consultants in, in the energy industry. And so we hired a company called Reservoir Imaging, and they produced for us kind of this repeatability map. OK, so here's our field um, that we were working around. And what they did for me to help uh, me make decisions about what lines to continue to collect, because time is money and want to make sure we get uh, the best data we can while staying in budget. <laughs> Um, is they highlighted for me which areas, so which stripes of like this racetrack pattern that the boat was shooting on, um, didn't wouldn't necessarily have good repeatability in terms of 4D. And so I was able to select those which I wanted to uh, shoot and those which weren't quite as important. And so in this case, here we've got the the side by side comparison of amplitudes, and of course you could see the big difference, right? And like, no, you can't. Um, it's really hard. You'd have to stare at this long and hard, even though everything was reprocessed the exact same way. Uh, these two surveys were reprocessed side by side, step by step, to make them as similar as possible. Um, but there's not a huge difference in, in the seismic amplitude. And so what you have to do is create a difference cube. And so in this case, we've got our, our difference cube. And we can see kind of in blue, we tried to mark the areas where we thought we had uh, water moving through the reservoirs in that area. And so that let us know which areas we were sweeping and kind of getting all of the oil out. Um, and then which areas we hadn't really uh, touched at all <laughs> with our production. Um, this is a case of 4D in Northwest Borneo. And so this is kind of interesting um, because it's a, a gas reservoir and they had a couple of fields that they were able to see. And in their 4D seismic, they had noticed um, that they actually had a, a fault that was sealing. And so they weren't producing what they thought they were producing. So kind of like, a, um, now I'm forgetting the name of it, a permeability barrier in, in the form of, of a fault. So that was a good thing to notice, and it, it kind of reduces the risk of, of drilling another well if you don't know it's there. And so looking at that same area, um, kind of more in a, a 3D sense, they've got their uh, current wells, and then this area that they thought was the undrained compartment that was sitting there by itself, not changing much, and their new proposed well, so their near field exploration well that they drilled uh, to get the rest of those reserves. And so, of course, with 4D, it's still uh, great seismic data, and you can, you can do everything with the 4D data that you can with 3D data. Um, you can run seismic attributes, you can do inversions, you can do reservoir modeling, and you can do some machine learning. And so this is an example um, from some work of one of my recently graduated like last week, <laughs> master students, um, Evan Jowers, where he looked at this Maui 4D field in the Taranaki Basin of New Zealand, a very classic 4D area um, that a lot of people have studied. And so here we've got the base of the Maui sea sand, upper sea sand, and the monitor survey. So t a lot of time has passed between these two. Um, and you can notice that, you know, whether we look at it in a, a surface, like a horizon map, um, amplitude map, or if we look at it in, in cross-section, you don't see a lot of difference. And so um, some of the things we did is we started running some attributes on these to, to analyze what, what the attributes could show us. And so in this case, we've got the sweetness attribute, so kind of zoomed out on top and zoomed in a little bit more below, um, where we can see the difference in sweetness, and we can calculate that difference and see how the sweetness attribute shows us which areas were, were better uh, swept. Um, and then here's a relative acoustic impedance model. Again, the same thing. So we're running uh, seismic attributes on two different 3D surveys and looking at the difference. And in this case, you can see the decreasing of the acoustic impedance difference as water moves up into that portion of the reservoir as gas is produced kind of more up higher on structure. <clears throat> he also did some interesting work um, in terms of 
using PCA, so a machine learning uh, kind of dimension reduction on, on, uh, unsupervised method for clustering. Um, and so he ran that with a couple of different attributes and he was able, and in this case, this PCA analysis, to show where we had more shore face facies, of course, justified with a lot more work than, than I'm showing here. Um, but so you could see some of the geologic variation in this machine learning, um, machine learning result, as well as areas that are kind of like a lighter purple, which are the more gas depleted zones, and then areas that are, are more clearly swept in the darker purple colors. So a really, really neat result that aligned with production data and well data. And so 4D isn't just for hydrocarbon movement. So as I mentioned earlier on or alluded to, you can also use it for carbon capture and storage. And so here's the Sleepner CO2 storage field. Um, we can see in vertical section or also in amplitude <laughs> um, how the CO2 plume grows in time. And so we can see that brightening of the seismic. Um, you know, over this, you know, roughly 14-year uh, period of injection. Um, here's another example of it, just showing it from another paper, looking at it every couple of years when they did a 4D survey. Um, so from 1994, before they did any injection, and then moving out every few years and collecting more data, you can see the brightening um, and where that CO2 is moving in the subsurface. So great for monitoring. Um, this is uh, the topmost layer, so another demonstration of the CO2 plume in the, the Sleepner field. Um, they've kind of mapped out the limits of where they think the CO2 was. It's kind of hard to tell. They've got like a red and then a pink and then a blue line. And so you could see where it's moving in the subsurface over time, like its preferred pathways. And then here's another uh, field, uh, Schnovit. I'm not probably not saying that right. Um, another CO2 storage area. Again, looking at a few different um, regions. We've got our baseline in 2003. Um, we've got data that was taken in 2009 and 2011. And so you could kind of see when you look at the differences. Um, so this is 2009 to 2003. And so you're looking at a difference volume down here by my cursor. And so you can see that growth. And then from 2009 to 2011, you can see the brightening that happened just during that two-year two period. So you could look at differences between different 4D volumes to understand how the movement is progressing in certain time periods. So pretty, pretty cool to see that. And so I'll just wrap up uh, with mentioning that 4D is a great tool. Um, if you really want to monitor your reservoir, it's also a great tool uh, not just for monitoring, but also for finding bypassed reserves. If you're able to collect uh, seismic at a at a cost <laughs> that makes sense, considering the risk that you, the drilling risk and the geologic success risk um, that you have, um, so it works for hydrocarbons. It works for CO2. I showed you some examples with um, uh, steam flooding, and I'm really curious to try to get my hands on some geothermal data to see if, if we can see variations in the subsurface with geothermal. Um, I suspect theoretically we can, but is it above the noise is, is something I still need to look into. And so the success of 4D monitoring depends on your reservoir, so it's not a given for every reservoir. Um, so uh, thanks for listening.